Hello and welcome to another edition of the Irish Angle on Jump Tool. As usual, I have Johnny Ward and Emma Nagel with me. Welcome, guys. Thank you, Vinny. Thanks, Vincent. Now, let's get stuck into it. Lots of things to look at from last week. Uh, particularly, um, I, I suppose it's an ongoing issue, but it raised its head again last week, is the new gambling advertising um, ban that's being proposed by the Gambling Regulation Bill, which is going to come into effect possibly before the end of the year. What you make of this, Johnny? Um, the TV companies, you do a bit of work for some of them there, up in arms over it. Yeah, like um, um, you can uh, take it from me. There's no conflict of interest from my perspective on this. You know, I've, I've, uh, I work in um, kind of football. I work a bit in League of Ireland. I work in, I've uh, done a bit for um, in the Greyhounds and I've done a bit in racing. So I, I'd like to think I'm pretty fair in what I say. But um, I, I, I've like you, Vinny. I've, I've been conscious of the practices of bookmakers in recent years. Your blog last week, um, I shared that around a bit on. Um, WhatsApp and there was a big reaction to it as you know yourself about the practices of, of bookmakers um, and in recent years you know with the books that have come out about problem gamblers and some of the um, I guess the VIP accounts all that we have had a bit of a change but I think there have you know good things have happened in the gambling um, industry and I, I almost feel like that the legislation here doesn't really make allowances for that and you know I always remember um, the ad for the Budweiser ad where you had the three, uh, was it the three frogs in the water saying Budweiser? And I remember being in college at the time and studying the media and all that. And one of the lecturers telling me, like, don't tell me that a kid isn't going to keep that in his head when he hears that. And it always stuck with me because advertising is, is deeply powerful. And you have to um, be very conscious, I think, of what you have on the TV with kids watching and what kids might take in as normalized and so on and so forth. But having said all of that, um, if you can can't show, uh, you know, gambling ads on a on a what is a racing slash gambling channel, basically. Like for for example, Racing TV, which is a subscription channel. Then you're almost taking away um, the role of parenting from the parent who's watching at home. And I do think this would be pretty devastating for um, the industry over here. In that, I mean, racing and gambling are literally tied hand in hand from the get-go one could not survive without the other um racing certainly couldn't survive without gambling and i i think this is a, a crucial um issue that does need to be addressed and anything i say on it i feel that i think the the Minister Brown and the, the gambling regulator, I think they're coming from a good place and they're conscious of the, the damage that gambling can do. But horse racing is is a, is a completely unique case. And I think, you know, advertisement, uh, banning advertisements um, at certain hours throughout the day on something like racing TV um, will be really, really damaging. Yeah, well, like a, a few things here. One of them from for me is if you... If you take the bookmakers, I, I think what they've done over the last number of years is they're using horse racing as kind of a gateway to get customers to go to more um, extreme forms of gambling, such as casino and slot machines and all that sort of stuff. So it's like in the if you take the illegal drugs market that they talk about things like cannabis being the gateway into that, and then eventually they get you hooked on whatever it is all the way up to your crack cocaine and that type of thing. Well, gambling has crack cocaine versions. That's the issue, isn't it? And they're the ones that are really causing the problem. I think myself, now maybe I'm, I'm not a hundred percent right on this. I don't have all the data, but it seems like horse racing has been around for thousands of years. People have punted on it and some people do fall foul of that and become addicted to gambling and have problems with it. But the vast majority of this we're seeing in recent years is around different types of gambling. So perhaps it's a case for saying at some point here, because horse racing is completely linked, as you say, you can't separate the two out, the horse racing and the gambling. But maybe we should have horse racing gambling, as in bookmakers associated with it that only deal in that, that they don't have casino, they don't have slot machines or whatever else it may be, FOBTs and all that stuff they had trouble with in England. Maybe is that something of a solution here to say that we align the sport with with horse racing bookmakers, not with necessarily casino and the rest of it, which is what they all seem to have tagged on and they're pushing their customers towards. Well, actually, just, just to come in on that, I, I, I've, I have wondered about this, how, like, could a bookmaker not be set up a bit, basically like a kind of like, a, um, almost like a charitable organization, but that pays its staff, but all profits go back into racing. That isn't the tote, because obviously the tote model is obsolete. So could, 
could it not could it like HRI for example could it not set up like a bookmaker in um, some sort of bookmaking account where all the profits go back into racing but just on that point Vinny like I, I, I'd be more I'd be a bit more liberal on this issue nobody's compelling you to bet on slot machines like if you have a gambling problem you have a gambling problem so the, the bookmakers are entitled to have these offers they're not forcing you to have a bet on, on the casino at any hour of the night the problem I would have then is if the bookmakers are, sh- are shutting down any sort of winning account they, they, they can't, you can't have it both ways but I think at the same time we're not in any state here we have to realize the racing is reliant on bookmakers money and bookmakers are not compelling you to bet so as much as you can bring in regulations we have to be conscious of the fact that these um, you know racing needs this this money to basically survive racing tv needs to have these ads to survive and let's come to a practical kind of conclusion yeah what do you think emma just looking at this again from another perspective i wrote a blog around some of this this week and if you look at the likes of um go back 20 odd years ago right before your time admittedly right but in racing the horse like Istabrak, he was winning races sponsored by smurfit shell aig europe aib avonmore stanley cookers all sorts of different companies were sponsoring racing you take the current champion hurdle winner Constitution Hill, his last six races have been sponsored by William Hill, Unibet, Ladbrokes, Betfair, Skybet and Unibet. It's all changed here, hasn't it? The bookmakers are, are hugely important now for the industry, the way it's it's so reliant on them in every way. Yeah, definitely in terms of sponsorship, I, I read the blog earlier and it was an interesting point made and I would agree on the whole separation of maybe, you know, the casinos from the racing because I don't think you know, if you have a chronic kind of problem gambler, I don't think they're going to, like I'd say the majority probably move from racing to casino, as you mentioned. You know, if you're, I don't think anyone is really doing as much damage as maybe is advertised on just racing alone, but it's definitely a big worry. And I think there's a kind of a few interesting points made by uh, the head of the Racehorse Association in Ireland. Um, just the fact that racing TV is, is a subscription channel. So I suppose like when you're going in to watch racing TV, you know what you're getting, you're getting gambling advertisement, you're getting horse racing, it's kind of goes hand in hand. So that maybe that will play in favor when they're kind of debating it in front of the in front of the regulation board and um, the same with uh, Sky Sports Racing although it's not a subscription channel like you know when you're going to watching racing you know it's going to be hand in hand with gambling and I agree with Johnny I think the whole kind of nanny state thing of it you know the, the government can control everything in people's lives and I know gambling does cause an awful lot of harm to a lot of families but at the same time for not just racing, I suppose, for a lot of sports, you know, gambling brings in massive revenue. And if if this is going to come into to play, it's going to be a massive worry um, for kind of sport in general. Um, you know, even like when you're watching Sky Sports there on a Saturday, watching the football, I mean, the amount of uh, gambling ads you see during that alone. Um, so, yeah, look, it's it's, a, it's very hard to see how it's going to, uh, the outcome is going to kind of play out, but you'd kind of hope that racing probably might, might be separated. But I think there's kind of a similar situation in France, um, where, or sorry, not in Australia, I mean, sorry, where racing is kind of separated slightly. You know, it's a paid subscription, I suppose. Now, how that will work with the kind of terrestrial coverage of racing with the likes of RTE and things, I'm not too sure. But, um, yeah, it's definitely a kind of a worrying uh, development Um interesting to see how it'll play out though yeah it is yeah okay well we'll we'll move on a little bit and let's look at some of the racing from last week Shaquille winning the July Cup what you make of that Johnny that's a fair horse Ross Ryan, Judy Camacho yeah and uh I think the um thing about a horse like Shaquille is that uh, you know there's so much I, I still think we're at our infancy in terms of um I know we just talked this week of um, kind of sectional time and belatedly coming into Ireland at all tracks and all that, and that's something to uh, to look forward to. Um, but I still think we're at our infancy in terms of actual data, uh, in terms of racing. But I mean, anyone who says a sprinter completely blown the start and winning, um, you know, top level races at Ascot and Newmarket, that that's the right, right way to go about it. But you remember some of these horses down the years, like Airwave, we used to do that. And I think the sprinter that doesn't tend to break well, and in the case of Shaquille, is really, really poorly away at times and again was free at Newmarket as well um 
it just makes him into a really intriguing horse. And I think it's, it's, it always, uh, I, I always find it fascinating when you have these horses that that's just the way they are and they, they have to overcome that handicap and still will still win well. And uh, he's developing into kind of one of the most sort of charismatic sprinters of our time. Little Big Bear's performance obviously was very disappointing. He had an, uh, an interrupted prep and all that. But um, as you say, Ross Ryan, Galway Connections, um, Shaquille as well for a small yard and Julie Camacho. I don't, I don't think he's the most, um, I don't think he's the most flashy bred horse either. He's by Charm Spirit, who would be, you know, a, a fairly low grade stallion. I think he stands for five grand in France, and um, by Invincible Spirit. And uh, he's becoming a he's becoming a proper character. I just I just like the way that um, I like the way that you get these sprinters, as I say, that kind of can um, overcome the handicap of of missing the break. And he's uh, obviously only a three year old as well, so who knows where he's going to go. Yeah, it's interesting, Judy Camacho as well. Only horse she has, as far as I know, rated a hundred or higher. So like a very small yard in real terms with no real classy horses and then all of a sudden this absolute star. The other thing, tell me about this, Emma. You see this in races all the time. Shaquille, right, misses the break, but then runs with the the choke out is over racing in the early part and Ross Ryan says, oh, to hell with this and sends the horse on. How often do you see this in racing where they don't? They keep fighting the horse in trying to keep it, cover it up at the back, and they never win those horses. The only way, I, I don't know why more jockeys don't do what Ross Ryan did. I thought, look, maybe he couldn't hold the horse in, in truth, but whatever way you look at it, going to the front may, was the winning of it. What do you think? Yeah, I don't, I don't think Ross had much say in, in the whole no. thing, to be honest. I think he said afterwards um, he was pulling too hard. But look, kind of in hindsight, it was a good move. But to be honest, when I when I saw him kind of pulling to the front like that, I thought all his chance was gone. And um, when he missed when he missed the break like that and pulled so hard, you'd think like he would have petered out. But in fairness to the horse, like it's all guts to keep to keep going, keep battling. But it's I suppose it's something you see maybe like Danny Mullins might do it a bit. And I remember David Mullins used to do it a bit on Kenboy. Um you know the horse might be fighting him and he just leave them roll. Um probably takes a jockey who can judge the pace real well to do it especially on on over jumps I suppose longer distance than that but yeah look it was kind of I, I don't think Ross had too much to say about that one but like in fairness to the horse he's been kind of a re revelation this year like imagine back in May and Guineas Day thinking that probably the most exciting trio would, would arrive on about 45 minutes after the Guineas and um, with all the hype around Little Big Bear and August or all and coming into it but he's kind of a horse you can really get behind um, really likeable kind of fella whether or not he'll be in training next year now is kind of anyone's guess you'd imagine he'd be very valuable as a as a stallion um, next year, but you kind of hope that he will because I think he's kind of one the public can get behind. It's yes, funny it's as well, as well Vinny, the, the brother, half-brother, or their slice, who was trained mm -hmm. by Ian Jardine by showcasing, who's a far higher profile stallion than Charm Spirit. 19 runs, never won a race, rated 48. So there you go. Well, the other thing just about sprinters in general, they tend to get better with age, don't they? They're like a fine wine. Um, so I, I'd like to see Shaquille around for a few years to come. Yeah, it could be very exciting. The other one then in, in that little big bear, what's the future there, Johnny? Uh, see, I don't know. I mean, it, I, I, we'll probably talk about another stallion prospect for uh, Baddy Doyle now just uh, in the next couple of minutes or whatever. But to, to be fair, like he had plenty going for him. He, he was exceptionally tough, um, very quick, didn't obviously stay at Newmarket, seemed to have pretty much gotten back on track. Um, at Ascot, I thought, I kind of thought he'd no excuses, but I'd give him the benefit of the doubt here because of the, you know, the reported holdup that he had and, and see if he comes back sort of later on in the season. Maybe... I don't think the ground is really a, a, a fault, but I, I, I'd, I'd give him the benefit of the doubt for the time being. I suppose he's the bubble has burst a little bit either way. Yeah, I'd agree. Okay, we'll move on to the other one we want to talk about. Aidan O'Brien's superlative stakes winner, City of Troy. What you make of this, Emma? This could be something really special. Yeah, like you, I suppose you have to say it's probably the most exciting two year old this year. Um, big weekend for Justify as well. He obviously had a very impressive winner in France, Rama 2A, I think, if I'm pronouncing it right. Another probably the second most impressive two year old, maybe the most impressive two year old filly, you might say, both by Justify. So a great weekend for Cool Moore's. Um, Sawyer's kind of getting away from Galileo again, like we mentioned last week. Um, so I'm sure they'd be very happy with that. But City of Troy, he kind of just looks like something special, doesn't he? And I think kind of nearly after he crossed the finishing line, 
uh, it's the same as when he debuted at the Cora. Ryan Moore really, really struggled to pull him up, um, which would be quite unusual. I'd say Ryan Moore doesn't struggle to pull him up too often. Um, and I, look, Aiden's quotes can be quite uh, exaggerated a lot of the time after a race, but he kept um, mentioning the word unusual about this horse. And, you know, you kind of just get that feeling about him that he maybe he might be something special. Like it's a kind of would be weary of getting too excited about a two-year-old off at a time because they, they might build it next year. But just being by Justify, like you'd imagine he's bred kind of with classics in mind. So like he could be absolutely anything next year, even finishing off this year, Aiden mentioned of a lot of most of the top two-year-old races for him. So we'll see how he builds on it. But yeah, like, I mean, I don't, I can't remember the last time I saw a more exciting two-year-old than him. And I think I wouldn't be big on the clock now, but I think the time's fast it up as well. Yeah, what do you make, Johnny? Is this something really special? Yeah, like I, 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 I like him. I'd be a little bit wary of of jumping to conclusions. That I just think this horse is a good, a good um, kind of microcosm of the last sort of five, ten years of Coolmore breeding. He is out of together forever. Um, you could, you might remember her together forever and forever together. I think there were two sisters, and it, sometimes it's hard to tell these Galileos apart. But when Aiden did that, it was particularly hard. But she was obviously um, a very good horse in in her own right. Um, won the Dubai Phillies Mile under Joseph back in what are we talking 2014? But the first three times, the first three times she was sent to Stud, um, she was sent to Warfront, and this so this is a good example of the the hype about Warfront at the time when his um, Coolmore took a took a gamble on Warfront, a serious gamble, and he was producing these beautiful looking horses. So I guess when the foals were coming out and the yearlings were coming out, and then when they were coming into their two year old campaign, they're like, let's 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 put more money into Warfront, let's let's uh, invest more. But Warfront was a glorified Ponzi scheme of a stallion because he became a complete and utter flop really for all that they invested in him and this was the first time then and and you don't you see that there are no no more war funds on the ground in in coolmore anymore um jesse has a very good one obviously the horse that's uh ran in the guineas and that won uh, the maiden since but the war funds um i didn't never tell you this in the record i'm sure he's had these fill of war funds but then this horse was sent um to justify to um come up with a horse called bertinelli and i think bertinelli is actually the best justify horse to have run so far in Ireland or Britain. And Bertinelli is obviously good. I actually backed him in Ascot. Um, he was, um, what did he run off 104 in the King George stakes and he ran well. But now his little brother has come along. And the the, the, the thing about both of them seems to be Bertinelli is a massive big horse. City of Troy seems to be very, very strong and powerful as well. So the just justify is the son of Scat Daddy as well, which would make him um, popular as a stallion. But he's only kind of getting going in these parts. And you'll see, obviously, Fozzie Stallion winning with Aspen Grove was one of the more high profile Irish successes but Justify as a stallion is fascinating and all of a sudden I know City of Troy again has that um, Galileo on the dam side so City of Troy is limited in terms of the mares that he can match which is the same as August Rodan but now Aiden really just in this series, season alone he's a scatter of serious stallion prospects I mean if, if one of these doesn't hit August Rodan River Tiber uh, Paddington and now City of Troy and that and maybe there's another one to come all of a sudden the words you know post Galileo looks a little bit nicer for Bally Doyle and Coolmore I'd agree yeah, yeah, definitely is looking more promising. Um, one other thing to look at from just the last few days, I see Wayne Lord and good news there. He's home after his uh, injury he picked up in the Irish Derby when he was um, unseated from the ill-fated San Antonio. He spent nearly two weeks in hospital. I uh, see just pictures his, his wife, Carrie Ann, had put up over the weekend showing he's back home with the kids, which is good to see, Emma. Yeah, no, it's brilliant to see him back. Um, not entirely sure what the extent of the injuries were, but it was it was a very nasty fall he got um, on Derby Day, obviously. So, yeah, brilliant to see him back and smiling. He looks he looked happy enough at home anyway. So, um, you love you love to see that. Yeah, this uh, flat game can be dangerous too, Johnny. Ah, uh, Jesus, yeah. Like I was just saying there um, recently, Sean Cleary Farrell had a winner at Kilbegan. Sean's actually, despite the fact he's the son of. Um, the late Sean Cleary, he's gone down the jumps route. He's, he's based at um, Willie Mullins. But I was talking to his parents there, um, obviously Tom being the dad, and um, his mother's name escapes me now, but I was, I was talking to the two of them. I'm really bad with names, and I was talking to the um, 
Sean's nephew as well, whose dad was a rider and he's already shown an interest of being a jockey. And Sean's um, mother said to me about the grandson, she said, I, I gave them a football, I gave him a football, it just made no odds. He wants to be a jockey and it is what it is. Um, but she started crying when she recalled the death of her son. That was in... Um, that was in 2003, so 20 years ago. And that year, um, arising out of that incident as well, we lost um, Timmy Hoolan. And the same year, Kieran Kelly died. So it was a desperate, desperate year for Irish racing. But we, we know in, in terms of the flat itself, like it's extremely dangerous. And like that day, I, I do remember being at the derby and obviously the, the poor old horse lost his life as well. But it was very worrying for Wayne Lord. And this was obviously a serious incident, Finney. He was in hospital a long time. They're talking about him coming back into the autumn. Um, and, and and the the falls that they can get, like I remember working the night that Anne O'Brien had the fall, I think it was in Killarney, and um, I, I, I was never as um, worried about a jockey as I was that night because Anna was so young, um, and the fact that she was a girl, maybe it shouldn't have made a difference, but it did to me. She's a beautiful young girl, um, just getting into you know, this game, daughter of Aidan O'Brien, and that she had a shocker of a fall, obviously wouldn't ride again, and it's just a reminder of the difficulties involved. Emma will know this a million times more than me, but um, I'm just so delighted that Wayne came out in one piece, and, and hopefully he'll be back in one piece the next couple of months. Yeah, great little rider, no doubt about it. Um, one other thing that caught my eye over the, the last weekend, this happens quite regularly, but I just, I just wonder about it, is we'd only one race meeting on in Ireland last weekend, a minor meeting in Navan on Saturday no racing on the sunday i see as usual coming up to galway we'll have no race on the sunday before it either busy week and we talk about the industry needs a bit of a break or the staff do within the industry but there's no other industry is there that that takes a holiday in your busiest days like no pub no restaurant closes at weekends it seem, seems counterintuitive in all sorts of ways what do you think emma is it a problem for the industry should is there another way of looking at this um, it's it's a funny one, I suppose. Like you, you, I suppose you can make the argument that um, every industry needs a bit of a break. You know, you know, it's quite nice for the staff and the jockeys and the trainers to get a couple of weekends off every now and again, um, because you know, although you could say they could take it themselves, like most jockeys and trainers and staff aren't going to take a break when, you know, there might be a chance of riding a winner, training a winner, leading in a winner. You know what I mean? So. Um, I wouldn't have too much issue with it personally, to be honest. Uh, I was actually, just to give a mention, I was in Cork on Friday evening and it was actually a brilliant day's racing. Um, great crowd, great atmosphere. Um, you know, just a real kind of happy, happy kind of relaxed vibe. It wasn't overly full, but um, yeah, like I, it's probably something that's been happening all the way through. I suppose, I think we were talking off air about maybe getting more staff into the industry, but it's, it's, it's a lot easier said than done, I suppose. You kind of nearly forget um, how specialised, I suppose, working and racing is. You know, you talk about maybe a pub or a restaurant, any extra staff for the weekends and this and that, but you can't really just pull any random 16-year-old in off the street to, to, to work at the races for a day. You know, they have to be pretty skilled. Um, so that's probably an issue when racing I suppose the the whole staffing and training staffing like there's talks about race being under under financial difficulty earlier in the week which is worrying because you know it's a kind of an ongoing problem in racing and you know if you could get these kids in and train them a bit more even if it wasn't just for a year's course than this but it, it would help the industry a lot and look maybe then you could think about having extra fixtures during the summer and the weekends but um it's probably at the moment I don't think it's too much of an issue to be honest. Fair enough. Well, look at talking about that. You mentioned it there briefly about the Race Apprentice Centre on the Curra, which has done great work over the years, uh, training all the young people coming into the sport, whether they be apprentice jockeys, work riders, or working in stud farms and that sort of stuff. What do you make of this, Johnny? It, it came to light. The Irish Field uh, pub published it on Saturday about the, the problems they were having last week. It turns out the Health and Safety Authority went in and weren't happy with some of the dormitories they had. Now, the dormitories are not actually for the the people on that particular course they're ones from previous courses and some other international students that that stay there and um they get b and b and dinner when they when they stay there they get bussed around to their jobs and collected each day but the dormitories themselves aren't up to scratch and they've had to close them for now and um, horse race in ireland have moved in and had a look at it they they partly fund well they they majorly fund the area the, the whole place but the actual apprentice uh course that we're that we're used to with the trainee jockeys coming through, that's not actually funded by them. That's funded by the Kildare and Wicklow 
education board so that's a it's a level four course um so that's the main funding for that comes from there but the rest of the funding for for the the whole place where they do licensing and all sorts of other things go on there that is funded by horse racing ireland so horse racing ireland have come in because obviously it hasn't been funded enough is the bottom line there hasn't been enough spent on making sure that these facilities were up to scratch uh what do you think of it johnny yeah, like I'd always have a, had a good time for race and the, the efforts that they do there. And like, I, I have to say, I wasn't aware of this until reading it there and um, hadn't, I suppose, been in my picture. I know that, you know, the likes of uh, Anya O'Connor and Paddy Flood, they've done great work there. And, you know, race is a great history down the years of not only getting, um, you know, I suppose embryo jockeys to become jockeys, but also that education aspect and giving them a, a really solid base to to learn their trade. So um, I, I do hope, Finney, it's something that will be sorted out quickly, and I get the feeling maybe it will as well. Yeah, I'd hope it will. Emma, you visited there not so long ago on behalf of ourselves, and you did a video. You, uh, Paddy Flubb was one of the ones you, you met there, and you met some of the apprentices who were on the, the course that finished recently. Um, what did you think of the facilities when you were there? I, d I didn't get up to see the the dorms obviously but i mean in terms of the the kind of equine facilities like you'd say they're 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 as good as as good as you'll get i suppose in any training center across the country um i've done a few courses at race myself i did the schooling course with Derek o'connor i've done the amateur riders course um probably done something else there as well at some stage but i mean like as far as training you get like it's probably you can't be you can't be matched for any kind of short course in any industry training so it's it's it's, it's a bit worrying i suppose but like you'd hope that it, it will get sorted you can't imagine um that the, they're going to stop providing the services they provide especially the trainee jockey course i mean that's kind of renowned for producing kind of excellence in training and riders and just even just the general stable staff so it's it's worrying, but you hope it will get sorted out. Um, I, you know, it's I think they're talking about the accommodation not being suitable, and you'd hope that will get sorted. I think there was mention of maybe the course not not being um, kind of fully on site. I suppose students might, might travel there in the mornings and stuff, but that will probably kind of more localize it to the Kildare area as well. I know a lot of people who have travelled from Cork and other parts of the country to do the course there, so hopefully it will all get sorted out and it won't have too much effect on it next year. Yeah, well, I think I think they'd had a very busy weekend as well. They had 23 people in their senior dormitories that had to leave over the weekend. So they they were all staff were in trying to make phone calls and finding places for them. So between and horse race in Ireland helping out, too. So between, I think, B&Bs and hotels and stud farms and other places, they've got them all accommodation for now, temporary accommodation at least. And it's all being paid for by horse race in Ireland out of this as well. And um, so that's good to see how long they can keep that going for. I don't know, but. I don't, I don't even know how much of an issue there is with the dormitory. So they need to be knocked and rebuilt or is it simply a case they just need to be repaired? I'm not quite sure, but um, I suppose time will tell. I think it's a guy called Darren Lawler from Horse Racing Ireland, one of the good guys. He's been sent in to oversee this and see if they can come up with solutions. So hopefully they will pretty soon. Okay, we'll move on. Um, horses to follow. One from last week. Johnny, have you a horse for me that you saw last week? Do you think he'll win? Yeah, I definitely think this horse will win. Uh, I was at Navin on Saturday, and it was like it was, you know, there's been a lot of, it's been a very wet July, and uh, it was very, very wet Friday into Saturday. Kind of avoided the worst of the rain on the day itself in that. Um, and I, I have to compliment Navin, like, serious issue with this, Vinny, just this is a complete aside, but like, and again, I'm probably, uh, probably shouldn't be given out about this, but 35 minute gaps between five furlong races. I mean, there are five, six 35 minute gaps at Navin. Um, so I was working this out. The first four races were all sprints. So on the first like 150 minutes of you being at the race meeting, there was about five, there was about five minutes of actual sport in the first 150. So basically, um, that's a lot of time not doing much. And in fairness, that's Navin haven't really a say in that, I think. But they, they had kind of a family day. And there was actually quite a nice atmosphere. Like Down Patrick was fantastic during the week. They had a family day. And Navin had a similar sort of thing going on Saturday. And it, it actually wasn't the worst atmosphere for very hard to sell a flat card at Navin, but the 35 minute gaffs for for flat meetings, it's just not on. You're four hours from start to finish, and it's a long, long day. And, um, you know, it's it's not a good sell for somebody going racing. But anyway, in the first race, not a sinner for Jerkeen and his son Colin. Um, finished third in what wasn't a bad maiden and the horse uh, she's by land force and her dam um golden amber actually had good form for william mccreary on softish ground but she was quite green stayed on really well was only beaten just over a length nicely clear of the remainder and um i think now it's not uh, jerkeen Jer and colin they're 
they're very similar. I think they're absolute gentlemen, the two of them. And it's great to see Ger with a, a nice horse. I think she could be quite a nice horse and definitely up to running in stakes level at some stage if she progresses and she does like it with a soft ground. So not a sinner, it'd be my horse to take out of it. Good stuff. Yeah, it'd be nice to see Ger came with a nice horse, wouldn't it? He certainly doesn't have many of them. Or I can't remember one that he had that was a particularly nice horse. They're always low-grade handicappers, aren't they, generally? Yeah, so that would be good to see. Emma, you've got one for me. Yeah, a bit of a shortage of racing, I suppose, last week. But I think we might have seen the Galway Hurdle winner in Leopardstown on Thursday. Jesse Evans. I thought you were going to say Party Central, who actually beat her in, in Veshtown. No, so no, there no. we go. <laughs> I think Jesse Evans, look, I, I, I backed him, I think, the last two years he ran in the Galway Hurdle. He was fair so unlucky last year. He was just caught up by Tudor City. Um, still only a seven-year-old. Like, it seems to be get, nearly getting better every year. And he always kind of obliges... He'd be there or thereabouts anyway, so I, I'll be in Vegas for the Galway Hurdle, but I think I'll be trying to back him from there, so hopefully uh, hopefully he might get the head in front. He, they're, local, they're local owners to me as well, so it'd be a great uh, celebration if he did it this, this year. Good stuff. I'm going to pick another horse from Leopardstown, another Noel Maid horse, a three-year-old filly called Encosta. Um, I, I think, I, I thought she would have won, to be honest with you. It was a 7 four long race. She was dropping back in trip. Um, at Leopardstown, she was drawn one. I thought bounce her out, make all and win. Chris Hayes rode her, and he's normally a very good judge of pace. But whatever happened, he got it wrong here. Went off like a scalded cat, way too quick. And um, was four or five clear turning in, and then fell in a hole coming up the hill in Leopardstown. I think there's definitely a day. Um, in and Costa off its current handicap mark, it's three year old filly. So look out for that one. Anyway, that's it for now. Thanks for joining me. Uh, we'll hopefully next week we'll be looking back on the Irish Oaks, which is on on Saturday at the Curra. And uh, keep tuned to the channel. Subscribe if you haven't already. And we'll see you all again next week. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.